Right, guys. Uh, so I think it's uh, it's all right if we get started then. Um, so my name is Ryan. Um, I uh, work for IT Online Learning. I'm sure some of you know that. I am a project management tutor, uh, specifically Prince to uh, Agile Project Management, Change Management, and Business Analysis. And I'm very glad that you guys have joined us today. What we're going to be doing today is we're going to be running through the structure of Prince 2. Um, then after we've gone through a little bit of the structure, we're going to have a look at the uh, the principles of uh, of Prince 2. So um, I'm glad that you've all joined me. Um, if anybody does have any questions, uh, if you, you're welcome to email me um, after the webinar. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, so let's get into it, shall we? All righty. All right, so let's have a look at Prince 2. Well, what is Prince 2? So Prince 2 stands for Projects in Controlled Environments version 2. And it's one of the most widely used methods for project management in the world. It's a structured project management method that is based on the experience drawn from thousands of projects and from you know, the contributions of countless people, sponsors, project managers, project teams, academics, trainers, um, and also consultants. So Prince2 has been designed to be inclusive so that it can be applied to any Project, regardless of the project size or the, the, the type of the organization, the geography, the culture. Uh, and, and it achieves this by separating the, the management of the project work from the specialist contributions, such as design or construction. So the specialist aspects of any type of project are easily integrated with the Prince2 method. And, um, and, and are used alongside Prince2 to uh, provide a very secure overall framework for, for the project work, um, the method. and you know, um, it focuses on describing what needs to be done rather than prescribing how everything is done. Now, Prince 2 is based on established and best proven practice for project and in governance of, of projects. It can be tailored to meet the specific needs of an organization and scale to the size and the complexity of, of different projects. So it's not a one size fits all type of thing. Prince will be tailored and we will look at that in the uh, in, in, in our final principle. And we'll get to that uh, just now. Um, so as you said, Prince can be applied to any type of project and can be easily implemented alongside um, specialist industry specific models. Um, so like engineering models, or development life cycles. Um, it's, it's widely recognized as well. And, and understood. And it provides a common vocabulary for all the project uh, participants. In doing so, it promotes the consistency of the project work and the ability to reuse the project assets as well. It also facilitates staff mobility and it reduces the impact of personnel changes or handovers. It ensures that the participants focus on the viability of the project. It's a very important word, viability. Um, it does hinge in quite closely with our first principle that we're going to cover, which is continued business justification. So viability is, is, is a word that I just want you to, to all sort of hold on to for a moment. Um, and and it, it looks at, at, at the viability of the project in relation to the business case. Um, so the business case objective, shall I say, rather than simply seeing the completion of the project as, uh, as an end in itself. And it ensures that stakeholders, including sponsors and resource providers, are properly represented in the planning and the decision-making process of the project. Now, it also promotes learning from project experience and continual improvement in organizations. It's supported by a worldwide network of examination institutes, uh, accredited training bodies and consultancy organizations, and also Axelos themselves um, and their consulting partners who can actually supply expert support for Prince2 projects. Um, for organizations that are planning to maybe adopt Prince2. Because Prince2 is inclusive and based on proven principles, organizations adopting the method as a standard can substantially improve their organizational capability and their maturity across multiple areas of business activity, such as uh, business change, construction, IT, mergers, acquisitions, um, research, as well as uh, product development. So with that being said, everyone, let's uh, focus on, on, on the sort of structure of Prince2 and, and get into it a little bit more. Um, so we're just going to move on to our, our next slide over here and have a look at the, uh, the actual structure of Prince2. Now, the Prince2 method addresses project management with four integrated elements. We have got principles. We've got processes. If you have a look at the slide over here, 
we've got themes, and then we've got the sort of wider project uh, environment as well. So that's what we would sort of look at as our integrated elements of, of Prince2. So Prince2 principles, they're, they're guiding obligations. Um, they, they, they help us to have good practice and they determine whether the project is actually using Prince2 appropriately or if it's going to actually be a, uh, a Prince2 uh, project. So let's have a look at uh, some of these principles then. Uh, you know, if you're not applying these principles, it's very important to note that in Prince2, we have seven principles, seven processes, and seven themes. If we're not going to be using all of these principles, we wouldn't be able to actually call it a Prince2 project then because each and every one of them are important. And I'd like to have a look at each and every one of those um, right now. So let's, let's have a look at, um, at, at the very next slide then, shall we? Um, before I go to the first principle, I just want to answer a question over here. I think it was a question of what, what actually makes a Prince2 project, a project um, that I get asked quite often. So what makes a Prince2 project um, actually noted as Prince2? Well, the flexibility about how Prince2 can be applied creates the risk that a project that is claimed to be following Prince2 may be doing so in name only. So Prince2 therefore sets up some criteria that, um, that makes a project a Prince2 project. And I'd like to briefly look at that. So for project to be following Prince2, um, as a minimum, it must be possible to demonstrate that the project is actually applying the Prince2 principles, that it is meeting the minimum requirements that are set out in the Prince2 themes, that the, the project's processes satisfy the purpose of the objectives, um, and that they're either using Prince2's recommended techniques or perhaps um, equivalent techniques or alternatives. Um, so the principles of Prince2, um, in a nutshell, quickly, would be continued business justification, learn from experience, define roles and responsibilities, manage by stages, manage by exception, focus on the products, and finally tailor to suit the project environment. Now, let's, uh, let's, let's go into the principles and we can go and have a look at our very first principle, which is a very, very important one. And I'd just like to sort of spend a moment on this particular principle. Um, the first one is called continued business justification. Now, this is very, very important, quite central to Prince2, because Prince2 projects have continued business justification. All right. There's a justifiable reason for starting the project. The justification gets recorded, it gets approved, and the justification needs to remain valid. And it gets revalidated throughout the life cycle and throughout the processes of the Prince2 project itself. So in most organizations, the business justification is usually documented in some sort of a business case. It's almost in a way looking at it from a sort of feasibility perspective in the beginning. So in Prince2, we originally have a business case outlined in the starting up a project process. So some organizations may use business plans or, or something as similar as business justification during the early stages of the project, although these plans may not satisfy the requirements of, of, the, of, of a business case. Now, business case is also a theme in Prince2, and it's also a document in, in Prince2 as well, which we call a management product. So that's the reason why I've said that this is an important principle, because it actually filters into other areas of Prince2, and it's very central to what's actually happening, because business justification is something that is very, very important. If your, if your project doesn't show that it is providing you with a return on your investment and that it can't justify its existence at various points throughout the project. It should be continued with. It should probably be uh, prematurely closed. Yeah. So the format and formality of document, uh, documentation may vary depending on the organizational standards or the needs and the circumstances, but the business justification drives our decision-making. It's very important to remember that. Um, it ensures that the project remains aligned with the uh, benefits that are being sought um, to actually contribute to the business objectives. So organizations that lack rigor in business justification may find that, uh, you know, that, that, that projects proceed even when there are very sort of few real benefits to be realized. And, and when a project only has, you know, tentative associations with corporate program management or, or, or customer strategies, you know, we, we, we are starting to, to, to play around a little bit there. So poor alignment with corporate program management or customer strategies can also result in organizations having projects that have mutually, you know, inconsistent objectives or duplicated objectives. So business justification is something that we originally need to establish very early in our project. We need to then 
to make sure that when we get to junction points throughout the life cycle of Prince2 that we check that that business justification still exists and it has to do so throughout the life cycle of the project. All right, and this will link in very closely with one of our other principles that we'll get to just now, which will be managed by stages, because they're very sort of defined sort of intervals throughout the project. When we manage a project by stages, we will be looking at this business justification, making sure, you know, does it still exist? If it doesn't exist, well, you know, you might as well go, you know, into the backyard, go dig a big old hole and go and bury some money, I guess. So that takes us to our, our very next uh, Prince2 principle, which would be to learn from experience. Now, Prince2 project teams learn from experience. Lessons are sought, they're recorded, and they are acted upon throughout the life cycle of the project. You see, projects involve temporary organization. And if any of you guys joined us in the previous webinar, um, we were saying that you know projects um, are temporary endeavors. You know, they, they, they're not business as usual. They have a, um, you know, they, they, they have involved different people. They're cross-functional, you know, people that are working together temporarily to basically deliver that solution or bring about that change. And, um, you know, then, they, then they'll be disbanded and then we'll move on. And then business as usual, the organization or, you know, the, the, the business that's going to then realize those benefits, they'll sort of carry on as normal Monday to Friday, January to December. So, because projects involve temporary organizations for a finite time scale and for a specific business purpose, um, a common characteristic is that projects include an element of, of uniqueness such that it cannot be managed by the existing line management or, or functional units. So it is this element of uniqueness that makes projects challenging as the temporary team may not have the experience or of the, you know, of, of the project like the one that's being undertaken. So Learning from experience takes place throughout the Prince2 project. And it's very much like life, I guess. We, we tend to learn lessons. We, we all tend to make mistakes. I don't know about you guys, but um, we all certainly make mistakes in life. And we, we try our very best to learn from those mistakes. So, so learn from experience takes place throughout Prince2. It's when, when we start up a project. Uh, previous or, or similar projects should be reviewed to see if lessons could be applied. Uh, if, if the project is the first for, for the people within the organization, then it's even more important to learn from others and from projects that, you know, should they, they should sort of consider maybe seeking external experience. You know, any, any little bit of information that we can take on board that can help us to improve our current project um, and the project ahead of us is, is certainly very, very important. Now, we say that we, we seek lessons as the project starts. And then as the, the project progresses, like I said, the project should continue to learn. Um, you know, lessons should be included in the relevant reports, also the, re, you know, the relevant sort of reviews. The goal is to seek opportunities to implement improvements during the life of the project. Now, as the project closes as well, this is also just as important because the project should actually pass on lessons. So if we go back to the beginning when we were starting up a project, well, the lessons that were passed on from, from a previous project perhaps could help us when we start our project. Now, once again, when we close off our project, the project should pass on lessons. Unless lessons provoke change, they are only lessons identified and, and, and not lessons learned. All right. Now, I'm going to move on to the very next principle now, which will be defined roles and responsibilities in Prince2. So we're going to move on to our next slide over here, and we're going to have a look at defined roles and responsibilities. Now, a Prince2 project has defined and agreed roles and responsibilities within an organization structure that engages the, the business, the user, and the supplier stakeholder interests. Now, for those of you that are perhaps doing your Prince2 and you are a little bit into your Prince2, some of you might even be at the practitioner level right now, you'll be well aware that we have these sort of three very important um, areas that, you know, that are the three sort of key principal interests um, that will be represented on our project board within a, a project uh, using a, the Prince2 methodology. So what we have to look at is that a, a Prince2 project has defined and agreed roles and responsibilities. So projects involve people. So no amount of scheduling or control will help if the wrong people are involved if the right people are not involved. So or, or if people um, involved do not know what is expected of them or what is expected of others for that matter. So a project is typically cross-functional. We just mentioned that just now. It's different people, with different skills working together. 
So it may involve more than one organization, it may involve a mix of full-time and part-time resources. So the management structures of the, of the parties involved in the project are likely to be different with different priorities, objectives, and different interests in, 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 in our project. So the day-to-day -day line management structures may not be designed for or, or, or suited to project work. To be successful, projects must have explicit project management team structure, which would consist of defined and agreed roles and responsibilities for the people involved in the project. And, and, and that is used as a means for effective communication between them. So all projects have the following primary sort of stakeholders. And when we look at it, Prince 2, if you have a look at the slide over here, we'll look at, at, at these three areas. Now, business, or we could say business sponsors. Um, for those of you doing your Prince 2, and for those of you hopefully that are thinking of doing your Prince 2, the, um, the executive on the project board would, would represent this side of things, the, the, the business side, you know, the money side of things, the business case. So the business sponsors endorse the objectives and ensure that the business investment provides value for money. Now, remember that point there that I've just made, continued business justification. When we're going through a Prince 2 project, we are constantly looking, you know, for that, for that business justification. Does this, does this project still, you know, show return on investment? Does it make sense to invest money in it? So this, this particular area here where the business sponsor sits on the slide is usually going to be represented by executive and they, you know, more than likely will own the business case and will be, you know, looking for the value for money. We also have the user side of things, which um, would normally be represented by the senior user on the project board. Um, that's the sort of who element. So after the project is completed, um, users will use the product to enable the organization to, to gain the expected benefits. So, you know, if we were doing a project and we came into sort of a, a call center, maybe perhaps, and we had a project to install new telephone systems, new computers, um, perhaps new headsets like this, so that the people that are working in that particular environment can speak to people and they have their hands free to type and they've, they've got maybe two screens. You know, they would have identified that there was a change that needed to take place in that particular business. And that change would be the face of obviously a project coming in, a temporary organization to come in, the IT guys come in, they put the new computers in, they set everything up, they make sure that the operating systems work, they make sure that the phones have got connectivity, that there's no sort of audio issues, that um, everything is running smoothly. And then once that project team is disbanded, the, the people in that office are going to be users. They are going to use the new system. They're going to use the new headphones. They're going to realize the benefits of that new system to their working environment. It's going to make their work easier. It's going to make their work more productive. So the users use up our, our, our product, basically, and they will be represented um, in those three particular areas on the project board by the senior user who represents the users. They, they, they use the products and gain the benefits. And then we've also got the supplier side. So suppliers, they provide the resources and the expertise required by the project. Um, these may be internal or, or external. So they provide resources, expertise, and skills. So, for example, if we were looking at supplies back to our, our little office project over there, if we had um, those IT technicians that were coming in to come and install that system and we had an electrician coming in to do the trunking and we had um, perhaps, you know, people that were coming in to maybe do a little bit of building to put in new desks to, you know, to, to fit two screens and that on. All of those contractors, all of those people that come in have got skills, they've got expertise, and they can come into, into that project environment um, as suppliers because they're committing resources to, to that particular project, which in turn the users will use, you know, and um, that's, that's, the, that's pretty much how that one works. So that's defined roles and responsibilities. But another important thing about this roles and responsibilities, guys, is that if you look at top line and bottom line principles, a, a top line principle would be to have defined roles and responsibilities. A bottom line principle would be lack of accountability. So now if we don't explicitly know what somebody's role or what their responsibility is going to, could you imagine really important work need, needing to take place? And we've got, um, we've got John and we've got Sally, all right? And um, it comes time for either a bit of an audit or we get to the end of the stage and work needs to be completed and we're reporting on the progress and say, well, 
Um, John, uh, did you do the work? No, I thought Sally was going to do the work. Sally, what happened? Oh, I thought John was going to do it. You see, there was no explicit sort of defined role in what the responsibilities for those individuals would be. So what that gives us at the end of the day um, would be lack of accountability. I thought he was going to do it. I thought she was going to do it. Nobody did it. We've got a big problem on our hands. So it's very important that everybody knows what their role is going to be, and what their responsibilities are, so that they can perform those, uh, those responsibilities within the role that has been assigned to them. Now, the very next principle that we're going to go into is manage by stages. Now, in Prince2, we will manage a project by stages. A Prince2 project is planned, it's monitored, and it's controlled on a stage-by-stage -stage basis. Prince2 will break the project down into discrete sequential sections, which we would call management stages. So what is a management stage? You know, let's have a look at that. Well, the, 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 the section of a project that the project manager is managing on behalf of the project board at any one time, um, and at the end of which the project board will wish to review the progress to date, the state of the project plan, the business case and the business justification, any of the associated risks, um, and also looking at putting together a stage plan for, you know, for the next stage and deciding whether we should, we should continue with the project. So management stages are discrete. They sequential little sections. And the reason that we manage a Prince2 project by stages is also to deal with what we would call the planning horizon and project management. Now, if I had to ask you guys today, you know, what are you doing this weekend? Or perhaps what are you doing tonight? Some of you might say, well, you know, I'm going, you know, with my significant other, I'm going out to go and watch a movie and to have some dinner. Somebody might be going off to watch the football. Somebody might be going off to have a game of darts. Um, somebody might be staying in to watch their favorite series and, um, you know, order in their favorite takeaway, you know. It's, it's, it's very close in terms of the time frame. So you kind of know what you were doing. But if I had to say to you, well, um, you know, what are your plans, um, you know, for the third Friday in October? You'd probably say, what do you mean? I kind of know what I'm doing tomorrow. I don't, might not even know what I'm doing on Sunday or Monday. But, uh, you know, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that the further into, into the future you try to plan, the less accurate it actually becomes. So it becomes very important for us to maintain control. And if we manage things in stages, or manageable stages, something that we can you know, have a bit of a grasp over, we, we certainly then have got control and we can do so accurately. The further into the future you try to plan, the more variables there are, your plans may be interrupted. You could say to me, well, in October, anything could happen by then. You know, I might have won the, the lotto and be sitting on my own private island you know, in, the next, uh, in the next couple of months, nobody knows. So it's important that we, that we break Prince2 down into stages. Now, Prince2 projects must have a minimum of at least two management stages. Yeah. One would be an initiation stage and at least one further management stage. So the more complex and risky the project is, um, the more management stages will be required. So the focus is on managing stages to ensure that the project is properly initiated before work starts um, on the delivery of the products and, and also, um, you know, it provides us with review and decision points where we can go back to that sort of element of control. And, and, and those, those decision points give the project board the opportunity to assess the project's viability. Remember, continued business justification. And, and that's done at defined intervals. Rather than letting it run on in an uncontrolled manner, you know, almost like a, like a snowball. You know, if, 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 if you had a snowball sort of you rolled it down the side of a mountain, if you're standing pretty close to it, in the beginning, it would be quite small and manageable. You'd be able to pick it up. You'd probably be able to stop its momentum. But if you go, you know, a couple hundred yards down the mountain and the snowball starts to pick up a little bit of momentum and suddenly you've got this big giant old snowball and you say, stop snowball, all of a sudden that snowball will probably you know, sort of just take you with it for a ride. So the, 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 the whole point of it all is that it's, it's there to, to help us have that type of control. And, and it allows clarification of what the impact will be of you know the external influences such as you know corporate budget setting processes or you know finalization of, of, of legislation you know and and it helps us to 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 ultimately make sure that um we can facilitate the very next principle in prince two which is to manage by exception now it it helps us to to facilitate that because that particular that particular principle is, is about delegating authority yeah so project boards would delegate authority a day to 
project day manner down to the project uh, manager. So that'll take us into the very next principle. So you'll see that a lot of these kind of lead into each other and, and print, print Institute is kind of like an interwoven web of, of interconnecting little components and parts that work together. And the more you look into it, you start to make these connections, you'll see the relevance of a lot of why this is done. Sometimes it might seem like a whole lot of jargon. It might seem like a whole lot of stuff that you've got to do. You know, if you say, why can't you just make it simple? You know, this is to ensure success at the end of the day. You know, and that's why if you look at the Prince 2 manual, it's called managing successful projects with Prince 2. You know, not, not trying to manage projects. So we can go into manage by exception then, which will be the very next um, principle. Now, managed by exception, a Prince 2 project has defined tolerances for, for each project objective, and, and that helps us to establish the limits of the delegated authority. Remember, Prince 2 enables appropriate governance by defining very distinct responsibilities for directing, managing, and delivering the project, uh, and clearly defining the accountability at each level. So accountability is established. Um, and, and, and just a little point there, I, I think when I said distinct responsibility, keeping back to the other principle of defined roles and responsibilities is the responsibility element featuring. So now accountability is established by delegating authority from one management level to the next by setting tolerance levels against six aspects of performance for the respective level of, of the plan. Now in Prince2, we'll have time scales, costs, quality, scope, benefits and risks. These are six areas that our project would be impacted on. Six very, very important sort of areas to take into account. You know, um, if we if we have a look at those, well, what is what is the cost element? The cost is the degree of allowable overspend or underspend against an agreed budget. The the the, the time would be the, the degree to which the project is allowed to deliver later or perhaps deliver earlier than an agreed completion date. If we look at the, the quality element, well, quality is how much something can vary from the agreed quality criteria. For example, a, a project to produce um, a, a new, one of these Fitbit watches, um, you know, might have a target that the watch should work underwater to a depth of 50 meters with an allowable tolerance of plus or minus five meters. The next area is, uh, is scope. So scope is the, allowable variation of the project's products and for example a project might be required to deliver all of the the, the must do or mandatory requirements but be allowed to deliver only 50 percent of the sort of should do or should have desirable you know sort of requirements we then got the, the the benefits so the benefits that's the degree to which we are allowed to either under deliver or over deliver on benefits uh, realized or, or estimated benefits. Um, so for example, the business case for, for a sales improvement project might have been modeled with a plus or minus 2% range of increased income you know, generation. Now, risks, this is very important. Risks um, in Princeton must, must definitely be considered as well because risks, they, it's, it's the limits on the plan's aggregated risks. For example, a tolerance might be set that the cost of the aggregated threats uh, must remain less than 10% of the budget and that the cost of any single threat must be no more than 5% of the agreed budget. Setting up controls are, are important so that these tolerances, um, if they're forecast to be exceeded, they are described as being an exception. So we, we look at managing by, by exception and I'll use a good example of this. We, we delegate authority from one management level down to the next, guys. So the project board will delegate or authority down to the project manager. The project manager will delegate authority down to the team manager. Now, what we're doing there is we're allowing authority for people to do their work, but they're doing so with still within a controlled environment. The same as if um, a mother and a father um, in a household, they're the sort of head of the household. They'd be sort of like the project board. And off they go, you know, to the shops and they leave their, their, their next oldest child in charge. And they will say, well, look, you're going to look after your little brother. Um, I don't want you to leave the house. Um, make sure that you just watch TV or read a book or does a puzzle. They are the ultimate authority figures. They've delegated authority down to the next in, in charge and, and given so within certain parameters. 
but then the next child down might be sitting there watching TV or doing something and say to his brother, well, um, yes, you can actually go and, and play in the garden, um, but you're not allowed to go and try and climb over the wall or walk out the gate or something. They've delegated another little bit of authority down to, to, to their sibling. So it's very much the same in projects. We, we, we have to delegate authority from one management level down to the next, which is very, very important. And when we put these, um, these assurance mechanisms in place, um, we can be quite sure that each management level can be confident that these, uh, these controls are going to be very effective. Now, our very next uh, principle that we're going to look at is to focus on products. Yeah? Prince2 projects focus on the definition and the delivery of products, in particular, the quality requirements. Projects that focus on what the project needs to produce are generally more successful than projects whose primary focus would be, you know, the, the, the work activity. This is because the purpose of a project is to fulfill stakeholder expectations in accordance with business justification. And uh, to do this, there must be a common understanding of the products that, uh, that are required and the quality expectations for them. The purpose of a project can be interpreted in many different ways. Um, unless there's an explicit understanding of the, of the products that need to be produced and the criteria against which they will be individually approved or assessed, um, you know, then under, under the, the principle of focusing on products, Prince requires that products are to be output orientated rather than work orientated. So Prince 2 calls outputs products. An input or output, whether tangible or intangible, can be described in advanced and created and tested. So Prince 2 has two types of products. We would call one of them management products and the other one specialist products. A lot of you guys will know that management products normally relate to, to documentation utilized in Prince 2, uh, base lives, records, reports. Um, and then specialist products, you know, are what we actually build, the actual product, the whole sort of idea of the project, what needs to be created. So an output orientated project is one that agrees and defines project products prior to undertaking the activities that are actually required to produce them in the first place. So the set of agreed products defines the scope of a project and it provides the basis for planning and for control. The guidance uses the, the, the terms outputs and deliverables. And these are, 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 are sort of synonymously used with the term product, you know. The, 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 the focus on products principle ensures that the project only carries out the work that directly contributes to the delivery of, of a product. That is, you know, that the project does no more work than it needs to do to deliver its agreed products. It helps manage any uncontrolled change. Uncontrolled change we could, we could sort of call um, scope creep because it, it ensures that all the changes are agreed in, in terms of how they will impact the, the project products and in the business justification for the project. It also reduces the risk of user dissatisfaction and acceptance disputes by agreeing at the start what will be produced by the project. Because sometimes people can be you know, overly ambitious when it comes to, you know, when it comes to what they expect out of a project. And, and we need to explicitly know what needs to be done. If you've got a new one who, let's just say, for example, help somebody to, you know, to, to build a house and, and you know, they say to you, well, I need a big house, I need a strong house. They don't have a, a whole lot of information to work from. You know, how big do you need it? Does it need to be the size of a castle? Does it need to be a mansion? Does it, does it need to be just a reasonably sized family home? It needs to be a strong house. What do you mean by a strong house? Does it need to have you know, strong walls around it? Does it need to be made out of a specific material? You know, so it's important that, we, that we, we do this all in the beginning of the project so that it is agreed upon. So we don't go through the life cycle of an entire project only to get to the end of the project and for the user acceptance to not be there. Somebody said, but that's not what I wanted. I don't, I don't need that. That's not what I asked you for in the beginning. So a Prince2 project user it, it will use product descriptions to provide clarity by defining each product's purpose, its uh, composition, its derivation, its format, its quality, um, the quality criteria, and also the quality method by which it will be judged. So they provide the, the, the means to determine effort, estimates, and resource requirements, and dependencies, and activity schedules. Now, 
Projects that might use an agile delivery approach will initially focus on the purpose, derivation, and quality criteria of the pro uh, product and the project products to deliver sort of initial features. And then more detail about the composition and format will emerge as the product reaches its final state. So the focus on products principles supports almost every aspect of Prince2 planning, responsibilities, status reporting, quality, change control, scope product acceptance, and, and, and importantly as well, um, risk management. Now the final Prince2 principle is to tailor to suit the project environment. Now let's move on to tailor to suit the, the, the project environment as our, our final uh, principle in Prince2. I hope everybody's still with me here. Yeah? Now tailor to suit the project environment. This is also important because Prince2 is tailored I, I see a few people are putting up their hands i do apologize um we we are we will try and see if we can maybe look at a, a question or two here but we, um, we are strapped for a bit of time today um so prince 2 is tailored to suit the project environment it's tailored to suit the size complexity importance team capability and risk um just bear with me for a second guys i, I do see that um that there's a there's a few things going coming through here um, um anonymous attendee how uh, will we receive handout notes in this presentation and will it be emailed to us? Please do email me and I'll be happy to provide you with any notes or answer any questions that you may have anonymous. Uh, Emma, bringing the new stakeholders on board to a new project, which part of Princeton is best to explain to them to understand what is expected of them and the uh, processing okay, which is um, Mr. Pavel over here, will the recording be shared with us after the webinar? I have COVID at the moment. I'm terribly sorry to hear that. I hope you feel a lot better soon. Um, and I'm struggling to keep focus. My apologies. No, no need to, to apologize, uh, uh, Pavel. We will see that a recording. Anybody that does need a recording, um, get a recording and it will also be on YouTube as well. Um, guys, I just want to go back to Taylor to see the project environment. I thought there might be maybe something wrong over here or you could hear me or something. Um, it is quite hot today, so I do have a fan on, so I hope I don't have any interruptions in my audio. Um, but let's have a look at Taylor to suit the project. So the, the value of Prince2 is that it is a um, it's a universal project management method that can be applied to take account of the uh, project's environment, size, and complexity and importance, team capability and risk. And it can be used for any project type, the geography or the culture. Um, I keep seeing that people are, are, are constantly raising their hands over here. Um, let me just see who this is. All right, um, Laura and, uh, and Charity, I see you guys have raised your hands. Um, please do bear with us. I'm, I'm happy to have a chat with you um, after the webinar. Um, but the, 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 the hand keeps popping up on the screen over here, so I do apologize for that. All right, so where were we? Um, the, the, in tailored to suit the, the project, um, the project management method that is used needs to be appropriate for the project. Um, it needs to be aligned with the method and the, the business processes that may govern and support the project, such as human resources or finance, procurement. Um, project controls are appropriate also to, to deliver the, uh, according to the project scale and the complexity and the importance and whatever the team's capability actually is and what risks they are. So, and, and, and also looking at, at the frequency of the reporting and then the reviews. Now tailoring requires that the project board and the project manager need to make proactive choices and decisions on how Prince2 will be applied. So when tailoring Prince2, it's important to remember that effective project management requires information, not necessarily documents and decisions, not necessarily meetings. So our PID in project uh, management in Prince2, which is our project initiation documentation, should describe how Prince2 has been tailored for that particular project so that all of the uh, people that are involved on the project understand how Prince2 is going to be used and, and how to carry out their particular responsibilities. Remember that you get different sizes of projects. So Prince2 might be tailed very different, uh, sort of put together very differently and tailored very differently to something like creating a brand new airport, which might involve a lot more logistics and a lot more team members and a lot more variables, as opposed to something like, you know, simply just uh, building a wall, for example. So we have to scale it so that it, it fits to the size and complexity of the project. If you imagine um, any of you ladies out there, you are going to be going to your best friend's wedding, 
we're all going to be um, part of the wedding. Because we've all got the same outfit and we're going to go and get a pair of shoes that matches. We all go off to the shops. And you go to the shop and you all need to find a nice pair of red high heels, blue high heels, whatever it may be. And mm -hmm. go into the shop and they only have one size. Now, people wear different shoe sizes. Um, we've all been made in different sizes, different shapes. Some the big feet, small feet, wider feet. Now, if you go to that particular shop and that person that owns the shop only stocks one size. If there's five of you, maybe two of you might find that it fits you, the shoe fits you. And effectively, that doesn't really happen though, because when you go into a shoe shop, there's all different sizes. So you're more than likely to be able to try on a few sizes and see which one fits best. Now, what that particular shop owner has done is he's tailored to suit his environment by providing you with different sizes so that it, that it, that it fits, you know, and everybody finds a fit for themselves. And it's very much the same with projects. We have to tailor it to suit the project because if we don't, it's not going to be a one size fits all type of, type of situation. So when we look at, at, at tailoring, if Prince 2 is not tailored, it is unlikely that the project management effort and approach would be appropriate for the needs of the project. And this can lead to very mechanistic project management at one extreme. So a method is followed without question or very heroic project management um, on the other extreme where no method gets followed at all. So. What we're going to be doing in our next couple of webinars here is we're going to be reviewing the themes and the processes of Prince2. And um, I think we'll probably more than likely go into, into processes next to try and see if we can fit in themes. Um, so please be sure to, uh, to, to follow us on, um, on socials and to keep up with our upcoming webinars. Um, if there's any specific topics that you would like me to cover in the future, um, you're welcome to let us know. Um, you know, feel free to comment. Um, and when we do upload the video to YouTube, please feel you know free to to like or to subscribe our videos as well. Um, you know, it helps us. And um, you know, we look forward to having all of you as part of our webinars moving forward in the future. If any of you are considering doing any Prince Two and you require any information about Prince Two and you'd like to speak to anybody, please do contact us. We'll be happy to help you. Um, so thank you for attending today's webinar. And um, I hope to see you on the next webinar. And for any of you that are currently students with us, any questions you do have, please feel free to let me know, pop me an email, and I'll be happy to answer any of those questions that you may have. So for now, I'm going to excuse myself. I hope you guys have a wonderful day further. Um, please do have a lovely weekend as well. And, uh, and take care. Thank you very much for joining me today. Bye now.